Well, good morning, church, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at, if you have your Bibles or your phones, have them ready. We're going to be looking in uh, at the uh, book by the name of Daniel as uh, as we try to try to think through something. You know, we're in this series, just a quick two-week series on what is essential uh, for our church, what is essential for us individually. We're learning, we were, last week we looked at the first church in Acts uh, chapter 1 and chapter uh, to do, 2. And so today I want to talk about keeping the church in balance, right? And so as we look at Daniel, uh, we're trying to stay in touch with our times, right, without losing our foundation. Stay in touch with the times, right? Be relevant, and we'll talk about that in just a second, without changing the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, we all know that, that things change, right? Times change, but the foundation of our church and of our lives must, uh, restay, uh, must stay the same. There would be a lot of people who would say that the church is no longer relevant. Uh, it's interesting to look at how we have handled changes throughout the years, uh, as we have gone through some transitions in our world. And if I believe if the truth were to be told, there is something that, that is in all of us that would like to maybe go back to some of those things that we used to do, right? So we have times and changes thinking, and some of them we like and some of them we don't. But there's probably something in all of us that would say, you know what, I would like to go back when uh, the day and the time period was like this, right? W whatever that time period were. So I was thinking about some of the good old days. The good old days. Now, I don't remember these things, but as I look them up, uh, gasoline was 28 cents a gallon. I mean, all of us would like to go back to that, right? Sure. Uh, the McDonald's cheeseburger at one time was 19 cents. Okay, I would like to go back to that as well. And then I found out in 1968, you could get a brand new Ford Mustang for under $3,000. I mean, sign us up for that. Uh, Levi's were only $5. I mean, you could walk anywhere without being afraid. Times were so different back then, and we didn't have to worry about so many things. Now, I found an article that, that I think is really, really interesting, and it really kind of shows us that even though things were so different, we didn't have to worry about a lot of things. And the article says this, the world is too big now. Too much is going on. Too many crimes, too much violence. Try as you will. You get behind in the race in spite of yourself. It's a strain just to keep up with the pace, and still you lose ground. A science empties its discovery zone on you so fast that you stagger beneath it. The political world changes so rapidly uh, you are out of breath trying to keep pace with, with who's in and who's out. And this article ended with this. Uh, everything is high pressure. Human nature cannot endure much more. And we would all look at that and we would go, yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. That's the message of 2023. But I want you to, want you to think about this. Guess when that was written? June 16th, 1833 in the Atlantic Journal. And then basically the same thing was said. Times change. They may be different. A few years later in the Boston Globe, dated November, November 1857, the headline was Energy Crisis Looms. And the subheadline said, the world may go dark soon. That was back in 1857. When you think about the good old days, right? The good old days where you have uh, the depression, the good old days when young men and women are dying in wars, the good old days of, of a crank starting car, right? Uh, the good old days of no indoor plumbing, the good old days of taking baths in a wash tub, the good old days of travel that took, that took weeks and weeks because there was an airplane. Are all of those all the good old days? What they said in 1833 and in 1857 and all the things? The fact is, it's just a matter of perspective of what is good and what is it? I mean, stop and think for a second. How many people do you know that would really like to go back and be a junior high kid again? I, I, I don't think so. That's just, that's just insane. 
So the tendency is to sort of sigh and long for those good old days. Just, oh, I wish we could go back to that time. Oh, I wish, because I don't like how things are changing, right? And when we wake up and realize that all times are the best of times, and they can also be the worst of, worst of times. Why? Because there's always been depravity. We must always deal with a world that's drifting in a world that it's, that it's losing its way with people that are following a world's leading that is far away from the truth. You remember a couple of weeks ago, I said, the further we get away from the truth, the further we get away from the light, the darker things become. But, but the question for us this morning, as we think about how things change, times change, things change, the thing I want to talk about this morning is how do we keep in touch with the truth while at the same time staying in touch with our times that we're living in? How do we stay in touch with the truth while at the same time staying in touch with our times? Now stop and think. Is it the church is calling to get locked into a time and then date it and, and, and saying that's where we're going to be? Is the church's job to say, okay, that's the period, that's where we're going to stay, we're not going to move? Or is it the church's calling to fix ourselves to the core values that do not change and the truth of the Bible that are on solid foundation and then navigate the times? So are we called, are we called to just simply stay fixed, not move, not budge, not do anything? Or are we called to stand on truth and the foundation? And yeah, we have to learn to navigate the times. I think it's the latter. I don't think change should threaten us. It should challenge us. Now, one of the things I think about when I read the book of Daniel um, is, is, my goodness, what great times it must have been for Daniel, right? I mean, what a great time to be living. Really? And then I stop and realize those were not great times. Let me give you a little list. His leader was a godless king who thought he was God. He saw himself, his leader, as sovereign over the entire world. His people had given up their values and had gone adrift. As a result, they were invaded. They were swallowed up by Babylon. Daniel was swept up in all of that. They changed his name. Those were not good times. They were changing times. But what I want us to see this morning is how is that Daniel was fixed on what doesn't change. What doesn't change. And so Daniel is in all of this changing happening around him. And then he says this in Daniel chapter 2, verse uh, 20. Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. So right up front, he's saying, you know what? I'm going to praise God all the time. It's all about him. His wisdom and his power is leading. And then he says something interesting. He says this in verse 21. He controls the course of world events. Now, that, that would mean times. It would be things change. He controls all of that. He removes kings, leaders. He sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. And so God loves change. Why? Because change makes us trust him. You, you and I cannot get rooted in any particular year, or any particular thought or idea other than the truth of God's word, because the truth is it's going to change right after that and something's going to be different. And so God changes things. The Bible says he removes kings, he establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise people, uh, and he gives uh, understanding to others. So whether it's a game of football or whether it's in church, whether it's in the times of Daniel or whether it's in the times of Paul or whether it's in 2023, our times are in God's hands. He controls all of it. So changes and challenges are inevitable. And they can do uh, one of two things. They can threaten us and make us want to fight, right? Or, or make us defenseless and brittle and resentful. They can do that. Or they can turn us free and say, Lord, it's all yours. Lord, it's your call. How do you want us to navigate this? Lord, you're in charge. Changes and challenges can allow us to become creative and progressive 
it really all depends on our perspective. So, so I came up with this uh, little list. It's a poem that I found, and it really kind of puts in perspective how we look at this, knowing that we stand on the truth, knowing that we are not moving and budging the foundation, but also realizing that we have to navigate change. So I found this poem and it goes like this. It's all about perspective. Today I can complain because it's raining, or I can be thankful because the grass and the crops are getting watered for free. Today I can feel sad that I don't have more money, or I can be glad that my finances encourage me to plan wisely and guide me not to waste. Today I can grumble about my health, or I can rejoice that I'm alive. Today I can groan over all that my parents did not give me while growing up, or I can feel grateful for what they did give me. Today I can cry because roses have thorns, or I can celebrate because thorns have roses. What today will be is up to me. I get to choose what kind of day I will have. And it closes with, have a great day unless you have other plans. You see, you will never have a great day if your hope is not on the rock or not built on the rock of Jesus Christ. You'll never have a great day if your hope is in the times in which we are living. You will never know satisfaction. You and I will never know uh, uh, relief. We will never have the right perspective if our hope is in the times and not on the rock and the foundation and the truth of Jesus Christ. And so we have to find a way to keep that truth, to keep that foundation while understanding we have to navigate the times. Uh, so David said in Psalms 11, verse 1 and following, it says, says this, I trust the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? It says in verse 2, the wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on the bowstrings. They shoot from the, from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. And have you ever thought about that? that you, have a, you have a pastor that keeps saying, man, just stand firm, just stand firm on the rock. Well, what happens if the rock gives way? Well, the great answer to that is what Paul gives David in 2 Timothy, but God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with the inscription, the Lord knows who are His, and all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. Now here is the truth of that verse. We may tremble at our times in what we're going through. We may tremble on the rock, but the rock never trembles under me. I may tremble on the rock, but the rock never trembles under me. David, David asked, what, what if the foundation trembles? But Paul says, it ain't going to happen. So you stand firm on the rock, even though the winds e increase, even though the waves come crashing, the times may get more wicked. Things will, will continue to just get bad, but the rock never changes. The foundation of Jesus Christ does not change. Now, we're, we're not talking so much about literal rocks here. It's the rock of our salvation. And this is the changeless presence of a living God. It's the truth of God's word, and it is like granite, and it has inspired its book. This is not up for change, right? Times will change. Be certain of it at church. We may tremble on the rock, but let me tell you something. The rock is not going to tremble under us. Our challenge, our challenge as a church is to keep our balance, uh, is to keep our foundation, to keep our truth in these trendy times and these difficult times, and these fearful times, when things around us just look so completely out of control. You know, there will always be trends. There will always be changes, but we have to keep our balance. And let me, let me caution us here. Be careful how we interpret the word balance. It doesn't mean that we fix ourselves in any given period of time or year or situation, and we just never move. It doesn't mean that we attach ourselves to some tradition about how something used to be done. Look, times change. The sounds and styles of music change. The presentations change. The programs change and the buildings change. Now, not everything changes, but for the most part, we are a changing society. 
And there are many, many places that have determined that we're not going to change. And they may stay in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they just plant the roots and they're, the roots and they're not going to move, right? Uh, you, you, we stake ourselves on the foundation and the truth of an all-powerful son of God. And, and church, that's not subject to change. Staff may change, buildings changes, programs change, pastors change. God doesn't. And so we have got to learn to serve our present age. And as we walk in touch with our times, there's nothing wrong with a building that maybe doesn't have some stained glass or, or whatever it might be, or there's TV screens and things like that. I believe with all of my heart for our church to stay in touch, to meet needs, to stay to stay on that edge, we must be able to do one thing. We have to be able to leave the familiar without disturbing the essentials. We have to be able to learn to, to change and meet sometimes without changing the foundation and the truth of God's word. It's, it's this leaving of the familiar that's hard for us to do. It's very difficult for us to do. Now, perhaps you're like me at times, that you don't like change. You're, a, you're afraid of it. And we have to learn to walk on it. You know, when I was a, a youth pastor, I was criticized for some of the methods of reaching students. Look, I was just keeping up at the times. We brought in pool tables and foosball tables and game systems and, can, and, and we built this cafe. And, and I know it just gets harder as we get older. What is it about the church that keeps uh, the unchurched on the outside? Well, maybe it's because we're not keeping up with the times. What is it about reality that causes the church to dig its heels in and say, we're not going to ch change? That just can't happen. So we've got to navigate this change and keep the foundation and the truth of God's uh, word. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be difficult times. For people will love only themselves, their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Uh, they will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. I mean, think about it. You can't go anywhere without, without people like this. And then we are told to stay away from them. And so the tendency would be to let's just, let's just circle the wagons, us four and no more. And it is difficult because we want to tell people about Christ, but we can't pick up that lifestyle. Times are difficult. Times are tough. And it's a tough thing to make adjustments, adjustments without losing our foundation. But we must. We've got to find a way to keep our foundation, but change with the times. Why? Because if we don't, we will not only lose touch with our times, but we will also lose touch with the loss. You know what it's going to take for us to stay balanced in a, change, in a changing world? It will, real, it will require discernment so that we can flex and retool where we need to. It will require discipline so that we can resist and fight when necessary. It doesn't mean we give up the message. It doesn't mean we lower standards. It does mean we discern our times so that we can see through them and know what the answers are for them. Uh, here is what we must be sure of. Do we believe that God is relevant to the needs of today? Do we believe that God is applicable for those needs? If we believe that God is the solution, then what are we doing about it? Because as we answer that question, it would shape how we do ministry. So the question is, is God relevant for today? I, I say yes. I say yes. This world needs God. This world needs Jesus. Now, relevant means closely connected to or uh, uh, closely connected to and appropriate to the matter at hand. So how can our church be relevant in these changing times, well, because God is relevant. How do we make this world see God, that see that God is the solution, that Jesus is the answer, even with how everything is changing around us? And so I want to I answer that 
I want to answer that with the Bible. So let me give you some context real quickly. Jesus and his disciples, really, they really need a break. Now, Jesus has just lost his cousin John to a beheading. The 12 had just come back from a work and witnessing trip to the surrounding villages. The scriptures say that so many people were coming and seeking Jesus, they didn't even have a chance to eat. And so if you can imagine all of these disciples, man, they're kind of like burnt out, right? They're peopled out. They're used up. And in Mark chapter 6, uh, you have the story of feeding of the 5,000. And of course, that was men, and you have so many others. Verse 34 says, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Now, we know that it's late in the day. The disciples say, hey, Jesus, you got to send these people away. They've got to go find some place to eat. And Jesus tells the disciples, you got to feed them. How are you supposed to do that? We only have a couple of fish and some bread. So Jesus blessed it. He performed what we call a brown bag miracle. You see, this whole story is compassion. And so if we're going to keep our foundation, and we stand on the truth of God's word, but we have to learn to navigate these times, it will be with staying compassionate. The, the ministry of Jesus on earth was defined by compassion for the helpless for the broken, for the uh, down and outs, for the terminally ill, and for the hopelessness of people. His heart were broken, was broken for, for those who had no one. When you look at our falling world, we ought to be moved with compassion over them. The one thing I love most about this story is the 12 baskets full. One for each of those disciples just to say, see, just have a little faith, a willingness to give some compassion, and God will multiply it. At church, listen very carefully. We must be a relevant church. We don't change our truth. We don't change our foundation. But we have to stay relevant in our times. And the way we do that is we keep our compassion for people. A relevant church is a church that believes that God is relevant to the problems we face in this world. And that he gives us what, uh, what it's going to take to be able to help and accomplish some of those goals. And that he would be glorified. Uh, Matthew says it this way in another example of this. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And then verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So instead of us just digging in our heels, would we have compassion on people? It's time for the church to be relevant because God is relevant to the needs of a fallen world. So how do we do that? How do we do that? We have to have compassion. I think the answer for our times is to remain a people of compassion, a, a, a church that is warm and welcoming, to have our hearts open to those who are stumbling uh, around trying to find their way to offer them a, a place where it won't get shaky, to help them, to help them get from where they are at to eternity. And that's the dream that I have for our church as we've talk, taken a couple of weeks to talk about some essential things. Remember last week, we talked about learning, learning, being a learning church, a learning people, worshiping, uh, a loving and praying. And we also have to learn how to change with the times and keep our truth, keep our foundation, because eternity is at stake for some people. That's my dream. That's my, my hope. I want to I close with this quote I found. It says this, The church that sits around, frowning at the future, doing little more than polishing yesterday's apples, will become a church lacking in the relevance and excitement. I think that's true. At the same time, a church that softens its stand theologically and alters the Bible to fit the future style will lose its power. That is true. So God help us to meet the needs of a lost and dying world. Staying true to his word, staying true to the foundation of Jesus Christ, while at the same time understanding the times that we live. And we do that by staying true to God's word, and having compassion. Father, I want to thank you so much for allowing us to meet together today. 
I ask that you would just bless everybody who's watching this video right now. God, I just pray a special blessing over them, even as we speak. Help them to continue to navigate the times in which we live. Lord Jesus, we tell you that we love you and that we thank you for all that you do for us. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, church, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. We love you very much. We look forward to seeing you in our campus. Come and check us out. Check out our website and see what's taking place at Alive Fellowship Church. God bless you all. Have a wonderful weekend.